Uh, my name is Wendy Mitchell. I'm a film journalist and film festival consultant. I'm in the uncharacteristically sunny UK. Um, I don't know if my lighting is, is worthy of Mank, uh, but we're here tonight talking about Mank, obviously directed by David Fincher. We're talking more about the craft side of the film tonight, which I am, you know, when Netflix uh, was telling me who was gonna be on this discussion, I was so excited. I feel like I, we could talk for hours about the technical and crafts and artistry of this film. It's such an achievement. Um, these experts peers have recognized that. It's up for six BAFTAs and 10 Oscars. Uh, what a remarkable run for this film. Um, I should mention that Eric Messerschmidt, uh, the cinematographer has unfortunately been called away in production. So he's not joining us tonight, but don't worry. We have four amazing experts to chat to. I, I wanted to let everybody know there are French, Italian and Spanish translators working tonight. So if you want to hear this in another language, click on the interpretation button. And as always, we want to hear your questions and don't feel like you have to wait till the end. Uh, just use that Q&A button whenever you feel like it, and I'll keep an eye on those throughout our chat. Without further ado, I'm so glad to welcome uh, four of the experts who worked on Mank. We have Gigi Williams, who was head of the makeup department. We have head of costume design, Trish Somerville, in Vivian Westwood, no less. We have the set decorator, Jan Pascal. And we have the production designer, Donald Graham Burt. Thank you all so much for joining us from various parts of the globe, even though a lot of you are busy working on other productions now. So we really appreciate your time. Uh, Donald, I would love to start with you. Uh, you've worked with David Fincher since Zodiac. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is this a project he had been discussing with you throughout the years or did you sort of get a call saying it's finally going? And at what stage did you come on board? Um, I hadn't heard about this. You know, I was working with David on another project that postponed actually. And, oh, what year was that? Like 2019, I believe. And we were having coffee one morning across from his office in the coffee shop. And we were sort of discussing some of the elements of the project that we were um, <clears throat> doing a feasibility study on and some of the challenges we had. And at the end of the conversation, he sort of slipped it in. He said, oh, and after this project, what I want to do is I have this black and white film that I've wanted to make that my father wrote and it's period LA and I want to do it real simple and blah, blah, blah. And I sort of half listened because I was so engaged in the other project, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm on this racehorse right now. I can't really jump over and get on that one. So, you know, I kind of put it on the shelf a little bit in my mind. And then that project postponed, ironically, about two or three weeks later. And when it did, Mank came to the forefront and he sent me the script and it was the first time I had read it. And of course, I fell in love with it primarily because, well, it's a great story to begin with and it's very well written. Like all of David's projects that he hands to you, it's, you know, the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. Um, but it also had to do with the history of LA and the history of filmmaking in LA. So of course I was highly attracted to it. And, you know, he sort of approached me and said, well, we're not really gonna get into this though until the end of the summer because of availability of actors and so forth. But, you know, I then just kind of started on my own doing some research and, you know, just taking advantage of the time. And David came on earlier with me I think we started about six weeks before the actual formal production got underway and kind of scouted on our own and so forth. But um, that's how it came about. And that's when I learned that it was something that he had and tried to make at some point in the 90s. Maybe, Trish, you can help me with this. I'm not sure what date in the 90s, but I know that when I first started, he brought me a box of location photos from some surveying they did in the 90s. And it was the old style, like photographs mounted on, you know, file folders instead of the digital. And they were black and white photos um, because he always intended to film it in black and white. Um, and I was looking through those photos thinking at the time, you know, so many of these places don't exist anymore in Los Angeles. So, so there's a very long answer to a short question. I apologize. <laughs> no, that's what we want to hear. Um, you know, when he says black and white, have you had a lot of experience working in modern black and white filmmaking? And 
Um, not modern. How no. how compli- How does it complicate your role as the production designer? Well, I think I mean it takes a minute to kind of just kind of catch yourself and say, okay, we're doing black and white. How do we approach this? And you know, I tell people that in the pro- of course we did a lot of testing. Um, and I think what what happened for me, if I can just sort of talk sideways and backtrack here a bit, was when I first initially started doing research on the project, um, I was very intent of finding photos, not only of Los Angeles, but of San Simeon and Hearst Castle and some of the different areas that we were gonna be filming from that period. And, you know, naturally they were all in black and white. And I found this treasure trove of photos actually of San Simeon that, to me, we're just sort of like, this is the movie. It's almost like I wanted to step into them. I found these night photos of the grounds of San Simeon, um, actually some with Marion Davies in them, where I just thought, wow, that's the world we want to be in. And, you know, it, it the first design aspect of it was, you know, how do I, how do I get that into my psyche and into my heart so that I feel like I'm living in that world every day with everything that I approach and everything that I do. And it was just about immersing yourself in it so much that it sort of became second nature. And we did the obvious testing because we were shooting with red and we weren't shooting and transferring to black and white. We were actually shooting black and white with black and white chip. So it was something where we did a lot of testing and I know that Trish was involved and Jan and, and Gigi also with the makeup and so forth. Um, but aside from that, I, I've told people in several different interviews that for me, the seminal moment, moment was when David standardized what we were looking at by having us all take our phones, our iPhones or Samsung or whatever, and put them on the noir filter so that as we went about, as Jan went out and photographed set dressing pieces as props was photographing, you know, different props, steno books and so forth, as Trish was photographing wardrobe, you know, it was all standardized. And it was such a subtle, you know, implementation of a strategy, but it worked so well because all of a sudden I noticed with like Jan and with um, Trish Gallagher Glenn who did props that you know, the black and white sort of started to become second nature and it sort of became intrinsic to the aesthetic approach to it all without having to go through the whole translation thing. And, you know, Jan would show me photographs of pictures of different pieces of furnishing or tapestries or paintings that her assistant would take and we'd look at them and she'd go, but this is too red and I know it's not going to work, you know? So automatically it became something that we became attuned to. And it, it was a nice place to be because again, I think it was that we all wanted to get into that world of feeling like we were living in a black and white world that we had extracted chroma from everything we were experiencing. That's just amazing. Um, and who knew an app can help or a filter can help us think yeah, about the world in yeah. a slightly different way. I know it's more complicated than that. It know. is. And, but, you know, you want to get to that point where you're just naturally without consciously, but subconsciously, you're just thinking that way. And, you know, you guys tell me if I'm all wrong on this <laughs> there, but that's my, that's my, that's my take on it. You know? Yeah. Jan, I would love to hear from you. Um, I mean, it's, even if it was in color, this film seems like a huge challenge as a set decorator. Can you talk us through a little bit about some of the, the obstacles and challenges you had to overcome and you know how you worked in the black and white? Well, the, just reading, uh, you know, interior San Simeon dining room <laughs> was a little bit daunting to begin with. Um, it, it really it was a challenge. I mean, and and I think what what happened as Don and I talked it through, it was Don giving us permission and David giving us permission in a way to capture the essence of it. There was no way that we could possibly recreate it exactly as it was, but we were after the essence of San Simeon, and with Don's scenery and, and the way he was planning to, to use the space, 
you know, it really helped us to narrow it down. You know, we found fabric that matched pretty closely to the real chairs. We found a chair that was as close as we could possibly get. And we had a local manufacturer in LA make the 22 dining chairs. And there was a prop house here in Los Angeles who made the tabletops and they matched the wood grain exactly. Uh, the way the tables were keystoned at the ends and um, you know, finding 13 foot tapestries that weren't in tatters <laughs> was a challenge. Um, you know, but the other thing that we discussed is that even though we had the benefit of the tool of our noir filter, we wanted the sets to be pleasing to the eye um, for the actors. I had worked in black and white before and we were shooting in black and white film and it was a totally different way of working. We had our own grayscale and did things that way. But then using the noir filter, we could find things that were pleasing to the eye so that it wasn't jarring to the actors. Uh, so when you walked into the sets, they actually looked as if we had intended them to be correct, right? But they worked with what the, the red camera was going to capture. So it was a little bit different, you know, 15 years difference and, and, and a different medium. Yeah. Um, it was different. And did the, the, are there lots of archives from the Hearst family or at San Simeon? Are there, you know, a wealth of books and photographs you could draw on? Oh, there are so many books about San Simeon. It was almost too much. I know we, after a while. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, we had to just close the books and just, you know, again, it's the it grabbing the essence of it, you know, um, and and the salon at the beginning for Mayor's birthday was actually the same space that Don converted for the dining room. So, uh, and I think that, you know, he did a great job disguising that and we tried to do the same with with the furnishings. Wow. I, you know, there's, I just keep thinking back to this scene, that scene, that scene, and, and all, uh, I can't imagine working on this film. Trish, for you, was it the same thing that you had to be based somewhat in reality, but it was more about the essence than, you know, nailing a specific outfit that Marion had worn, for instance? Well, I did go to visit Don as much as I could because he, he gets to start quite a bit before I do. And he has great research material. So I kind of try and, whether he's in or not, if he's not in, I definitely sneak in and kind of snoop around. Don't listen, Don. And then if he is in, I go and we have really great conversations. And he's very generous with his information. So that helps me greatly. Because, you know, it's I'm dressing characters that have to fit into that world that he's creating. So we also, in our costume department, did vast amount of research. And, um, you know, it is the thing of, of, of capturing the essence and then knowing what that's going to translate into in black and white. And I think it's pretty much kind of goes hand in hand with costumes and with production design and furniture and tapestries. It's all the shades and tones you're going to get in between what you think black and white is, and then trying not to lose all the details and the subtleties. I mean, I use very little black clothing at all. Even for the funeral scene, we use very few black dresses and very few black um, suits, and it was mainly on background. Um, so I think it was just for me as well, using the noir filter, um, I had started photographing some costumes and fabrics and sent it to Dave and Eric Messerschmidt and asked them, I did three settings in my phone and asked them which one would be the closest to where they thought they would go. So as you know, as Don mentioned and Jen mentioned as well, it helped us so much because you know, there's the thing with prints and patterns and textures, there's a lot of times you think how something's gonna look and then we would line all those clothes up like you know, 14, 15 dresses and take a photo from a distance and immediately you knew what you had to pull out, which wasn't gonna work. Because mm. a lot of prints and and uh, patterns get very popcorn-y, very confetti and get too bold. And we had to work with a lot of just keeping the tones very even. And how Don had mentioned it was, you know, not having, and, and Jen, how not having too much color on a set because Dave doesn't really like color. 
um, and then trying to keep the tone of what the film is for the actors so they could stay in their characters and who they were. But as far as for matching things up, we went with the idea of Marion Davies and I wanted it to be very, um, her to always be the lightest color. So everything for her was light so that whenever she entered the room, everyone's eyes kind of went to her. When Mank enters the room, he can find her quickly. The only thing we kind of matched up as close as we could was the circus party. We did try and, and did try and reproduce those costumes as close as we could. Oh my gosh. I mean, that circus party, yes, can we just talk about this? Is that the biggest challenge of your career? There's amazing costumes. No, I, oddly not the biggest challenge of my career, because um, I do tend to pick challenging shows, but um, <laughs> but it was just really, it was really, really fun. And I think the challenging part of it for, for me was once I knew it was going to be 22 guests, then it was like, oh no, which costumes do I want to show? You know, because it was trying to have a variety there. And also I had gone over with Gigi. There was a couple, you know, we had all these, all these great photos from that party. And originally, Don, what was was it Lederhosen was the first idea? Yeah, we, something like that. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, I gotta, I want to say this, Trish did such a better job with the costumes than they did in the original party research photos. Because to me, I always say it, it looked like a bad Halloween party. <laughs> and, well, you know, I think tried. what you did made it so much better. Oh, thank you. I mean, we tried to, we tried to make, you know, things fit a lot better when you do look at the original photos. I think even for Hearst, like that type of a gentleman who's so wealthy, his jacket was just so ill-fitting and he had this giant in my head, it was a pink and white bow tie that was massive, almost like a clown's bow tie. So, you know, in my head with Charles Dance being Hearst, I just thought, okay, when he has to give this, the monkey grinder parable, this walking, I don't want him to be clown-like. I don't want him to be a joke. So we had to take this LeMay jacket, but make him be very pulled together and kind of more elegant and debonair. But yeah, that, that party was really a lot of, it was a lot of fun. And even like working with Gigi of like, who were we gonna see? Cause they had all these images cause they had, would have a party every year with different themes. And, um, and so in these images, there's, you know, there's Clark Gable, even though it's a circus party, Clark Gable's dressed as a cowboy. And then there's Betty Davis in a gown with just a Mirabu beard on. So Gigi and I would work together to find, uh, you know, I'd pick some background people and bring them to her and say, can you make this person be this person, you know? So it was a lot of trying to just pick and choose specific things out of all the imagery that we found that would work. Yeah, and Gigi, was that scene uh, the most important for your work uh, for this film? Mm, I don't, gosh. I don't know, that was, um, it was obviously her scene. And we hadn't really been able to hone in on the background as much as we did on that scene. So that did become a lot of fun. I mean, we could actually spend some time and, uh, you know, create a little more for that scene. There weren't as many people in that scene as some of the others. So some of the others were, a lot more challenging. Uh -huh. you know, and, you know, I have, yeah, sorry, the backlog scene was a great scene too, you know, for so many reasons. I mean, I love the production design in that scene so much because it just transports you immediately to the, that time period. And we had lion tamers and, you know, we had uh, uh, Edith Head and we had constantly little characters that we threw in there and it's just, that scene is so beautiful. And we started at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> well, oh, we were I just finishing when you started. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say something about what you two did with even the background people. When the background folks walked onto the set, I don't know what you said to them, but they all carried themselves as the people of the era. And I think that it is a great compliment to you two for putting them in that zone and David as well. But it, it just, you know, we saw people posed in the mayor birthday scene and there was a photograph that my outside dresser took that they looked like they just walked out of a photograph from that era. And it, it just, I, I don't know if I've told you enough, but I think that that was amazing. Oh, thank you. 
I love I the camaraderie of your team here too. I mean, one re really interesting thing is that this film is obviously the thirties and the forties. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, maybe starting with you, Gigi, I mean, did the makeup looks change a lot between those eras? Change. Um, what I tried to do, Bert was talking about, Don was talking about the essence, you know, making the essence of the film. Well, our actors didn't really look like the people that they were supposed to be playing. So in order to, to, to capture that essence, what I did in, in my research was look at all of the black and white photos. They're all 2D. They're all black and white photos. Not really great lighting in them. A lot of top lighting, a lot of you know, shadows. And I basically looked at those photographs until I knew them by heart. And then when we went to test the actors, I would literally just take that photograph and transpose it on that person's face. Mm -hmm. So like with the Charles Dance, um, Hurst, he doesn't look at all like William Hurst, um, but Hurst has these cadaver, what I call cadaver eyes. They're very deep set. He's got a, a big bone here and he always looks somewhat dead. So that's what I did with him. I made these very, very deep eyes that scared him to death when he first saw it. In fact, even people in my trailer were like, uh, you think it's a little much, don't you think, Gigi? And actually I went further than that later on. <laughs> but everybody pretty much um, played along. They all, they were thrilled to take whatever you gave them, whatever you were trying to give them for their character, they were all on board. There was a lot of trust between the actors and our departments and right. that. What about Gary Oldman? What, had you worked with him before, Gigi, or how did we transform him into Mank? I had worked with him before, but it was 30 years ago on profession. Uh, so he didn't remember me. I, I remembered him. But um, he originally wanted to use a lot of prosthetics. He wanted to shave his head back to here and use a comb over. And, and David really wanted him bare wanted him nude, nothing between him and the camera. And that was difficult to get Gary to that place because as an actor, as an actor that he is, he likes to hide behind stuff. So that was a challenge. That was a huge challenge. And he starts in the first time we see him, he's three years or four years from his death, really. He's um, 43 or something. And just at the bottom of his alcoholism. And then we do flashbacks to 20 years, 25 years behind. So I knew I couldn't really make him look 25 years younger. But I, could, I, could, I could give you a difference between the two. But what I decided to do was when he's having his flashbacks, I wanted him to be remembering his flashbacks. So he doesn't actually flash back to there. He's a little outside of his flashback. He's not as polished as the people in the flashback. So it becomes more of his memory of the flashback. And I think that worked. I think that translated. That's really fascinating. And, and Trish, what about you working with Gary? Did he have ideas on, on the wardrobe? Did he, you know, were you able to source anything vintage for him or did it, or is that stuff too sort of ratty to wear now? Yeah, I mean, we we built, I, I would think about 90% of the principal's costumes and then had to supplement quite a bit of the background as well, making base pieces because, you know, you're talking clothes that are 90, over 90 years old. So when you do find things, they're not in the greatest shape. I did pull, you know, items for the silhouette for, to find interesting sleeves and cuts and garments. And so that we could keep that very accurate and also brought a lot of things in to look at weights because woolen weights are much different now as our rayons and cotton. So just trying to be very authentic in the fabrications that we had. But um, Gary does definitely come with ideas, which I did welcome because he, he definitely does his research. He is, like Gigi said, he's all in. Um, so that helped me a lot. He was willing to put on the weight uh, he progressively put it on the first time I saw him. He even warned me, he's like, I'm going to put on probably about five to eight more pounds. So that helped a lot because he, I mean, I, I three, like between Charles Dance, Arliss Howard and Gary, they're very, in their real life, they're very lean, very fit, 
men with strong shoulders. So um, at least with Gary, I didn't have to build out a padded suit. With, with Hearst and Arliss, I had to build out padded suits starting at the chest through the waist. And then with Tom Peffrey, who plays Meg's brother, I had to ask him to stop working out because he had a very, he had very, very broad shoulders. So I was like, please just stop working out and start eating some fats. So, um, but with Gary, he was fantastic. I mean, he would, we would do this thing where we would, you know, build his shirt collars a little bit too tight and he would just pull his neck out to try and give himself this double chin. And it was also, as Gigi mentioned, this progression of his time and his person and, and his progression of his alcoholism and his aging. It was, you know, changing his silhouette ever so slightly because Mank as the man, I mean, the thing with Dave's films and especially this one is there's just always that authenticity. It's real. We're not doing a Hollywood glamour film. We're not doing things for shock value. It's just whatever that character is in that script and the words on the page, they're as authentic as possible to that particular subject matter. And so I really wanted all the characters in this film to be real. So we see, you know, Gary's character Mank is not a man who would have 15 suits in his, or even eight, six suits in his closet. So it was keeping his suits. He has this one good suit that in my mind, in his closet, he has the suit that is the wedding suit and the funeral suit. And then he has his summer suits and his winter suits for work. And so it was just kind of trying to show a bit of age with the slight change in the lapel or single and double breasted where we chose to have his pants ride as he got older they went lower below his belly to show more fat so small things like that you know and, and having his clothes be very worn in like we did a lot of aging but subtle aging so he's not dirty he's just yeah. really lived in like really really lived in yeah he wouldn't be a freshly pressed kind of Guy. My um, joke is like Sarah starts him, his poor Sarah starts him off great for the day, and where he goes from there, she has no idea. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have to sort of geek out and ask about the the dress that Marion is wearing when she and Mank are walking around the sort of at night around the her estate. Um, because it struck me, I mean it's a beautiful dress, but it struck me really the light, how the light hit that dress um and I was wondering if that's something you tested a lot um how you knew that dress was gonna look the right way in black and white in that night nighttime scene I found this um 30s dress in at western costume oh no at uh, one at western costume and one at MPCC and they both one of them was this really unattractive chartreuse and one was this hot pink but the the fluidity and the liquidness and almost like this mercury feeling of this fabric I love. So I had, we call it, you know, it's like our fabric sourcers and our fabric hunters. It's like, find this in a color I can live with, you know? <laughs> so, so if we're the, like our naked eye, cause again, we're having to deal with it with our naked eye, but then how great it looks on, on the monitor that we know it's going to be on screen that way. So um, we found this, this kind of a, it's a very antique gold lame fabric. And once I found the fabric, then I did the illustration for the dress because I knew I wanted it to be bias cut because of Amanda's body type and being true to the period. I knew I wanted to have a lot of movement in the sleeves because I sh Amanda's very animated as is Marion, so she moves a lot. And I knew I wanted the back to be low and there to be a train. So uh, my cutter fitter on this Marilyn Manson is just exemplary at at fit and at form. And LeMay's a hard fabric to work with. So once we found the fabric, I knew she was gonna transition from inside and knowing that setting is a bit dark and then go out to moonlight. So then I just took the fabric home at night and would look at it outside in the moonlight, out by my pool, turn some lights on, turn some lights off and just see that it would still give me some, to some life to it, but not blow up you know, under all the lights. And luckily it all worked. And, it was, you know, I kind of knew how I wanted it to look and I felt like, okay, I'm good. And then Dave goes, yeah, and then she's gonna, she's gonna um, be walking, take her shoes off, have a bottle of gin, maybe give Gary her shoes. So I'm like, okay, I'll put a loop on the train so she can carry it. And then just like a couple of days before we shoot, he goes, oh yeah, and then, so she'll walk out and then she's gonna hop up on the fountain. I went, she's gonna hop up on a fountain? Wait, what's happening, <laughs> you know? So that's when I had a little bit of a panic of like, she's gonna hop up on a fountain in a bias cut gown. Okay, I hope this goes well. <laughs> And then Gary being ever the gentleman, you know, helps her, balances her. So I, I'm really appreciative to him for that. 
Wow. Um, and Donald, as you mentioned, you know, the, one of the first things that David was telling you is this is a film about LA history, about Hollywood history. Um, I was curious, you know, did you feel extra pressure because this is a business you work in and these are the very foundations of, you know, one of the greatest films in film history. Uh, did you go back and watch Citizen Kane? Was that necessary? I, I watched it just to watch it. I didn't watch it, you know, for the, for the idea that we're gonna replicate it in any kind of way, shape or form. You know, it wasn't Citizen Kane, it's a separate film that we were doing. And quite honestly, I didn't feel pressure. I was actually kind of excited about, you know, the history of the film business in Los Angeles and the history of Los Angeles, you know? It, it wasn't pressure, it was like an opportunity, you know? So you could enjoy it almost. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I actually love that part of it. It was, it, it was something that I really cherish. You know, it was sort of the bonus of coming away with this film. It was right. like you know being able to delve into all the historical facts and you know over at the academy, the library at the um, the academy there had original documents from so many of the characters that we had in the film and from studio heads. And it was just interesting to read it and understand the way of filmmaking and the way of life that these people had, you know, the nuances that they had, the gambling habits, the drinking habits and all that. Well, I, I see we've got a special surprise guest. We didn't think he could make it, but cinematographer Eric Messerschmidt is here. Thank you for joining us, Eric. Uh, I'm sure, of course, since the Saturday late, I'm shooting. So we, we, uh, we, we had perfect light. So we, we went to lunch a little late. So I'm so sorry I'm late, but happy well, to be here. Well, we're glad Thanks you're here now. Me. I think your video might be frozen, but we can hear you. So we're gonna okay. chat. Um, okay. You know, you were shooting black and white. I was wondering how much you had worked in black and white before and had you ever, you know, shot in black and white for black and white rather than shoot in color to then transfer to black and white? Um, I had not shot a lot. I mean, I hadn't really seriously shot black and white since film school. And that was the last time. Uh, I mean, I had probably done, I'd done a commercial or two and a music video or two. Um, you know, one of which was probably on Super 8. And and the last time I seriously shot Black and White, we were shooting film. So, um, no, I uh, this was a, a relatively new experience for me, in, in at, at least um, recently, for sure, yeah. And how, how did, you know, there's different kinds of Black and White. There's different tones, there's different lighting. I mean, how did you and David talk about how you wanted this black and white to be in this film? And was it different, the sort of 30s black and white versus the 40s scenes? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, we we spoke mostly in, um, in through the assistance of, of, of reference material, you know, images, photography, um, film stills. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, the, you know, the canon of black and white photography, the, the, the spectrum of it is enormous. And I, you know, initially I think um, I was attracted to, to noir um, just, just aesthetically, but it, it didn't really feel appropriate to the film. And as we talked about it more, it, it felt less and less appropriate. So there are certainly moments in the movie that, that are quite noir, I suppose, but in general, it didn't feel like the right uh, the right style, just given the material, you know. Um, so we uh, we sort of agreed that there would be there would be hints of modernism uh, and, and modern technique, and, and the you know, particularly when it comes to lighting, um, uh, and um, with with a sprinkling of, of of classic cinema techniques as well and it's it's so it's the movie is a bit of a mix i i guess uh in the end um and it's really sort of trying to be as, as story relevant as possible uh does that make sense um yeah yeah i mean you know it's it's to be, to be honest I, the I was, I, I never wanted it to be a parody. You know, I was always worried that it was like, if, if we lean too heavily into, um, into classic, true classic lighting technique in particular, uh, that, that it, would, it would be a distraction, um, you know, and it would be intrusive for the, for the, uh, 
uh, for the audience. So, uh, it was, you know, it's trying to find that line. And, you know, it's like, that's always a conversation a, a, between a, uh, um, a director and a DP, I think, you know, it's trying to find that line of, of where, how, how much realism, how much homage, et cetera. Yeah, I think especially with this film, because it's so sort of immersed in Hollywood history, but without just becoming cliches of Hollywood history. I think with all of your work, um, you know, all five of you. Um, and Eric, just in case we've got some cinematographers joining us, um, this might go over my head, but can you tell us a little bit about the camera you used and, and what you got out of it? Was it why you, why you chose that camera? Sure. Um, yeah, we shot on the on the red uh, on a red monochrome. It was a helium monochrome camera in 8K. Uh, uh, red put it together for us in a, um, in a specialized camera body we called the Ranger. Um, and it's uh, it's a, it's a monochrome sensor. It only captures black and white images. Um, and we had done a variety of tests. Uh, comparing color against the black and white sensor. And it was uh, an immediate, um, it, the, the decision was obvious. I, it had just tremendous depth, uh, tonal depth to it. It almost had a three dimensionality to it. And it looked very much like a, sort of like a platinum print. Um, and and uh, the, the desaturated color image just looked quite dull in comparison in our opinion. So um, it, it was an easy choice. Uh, and the results uh, of it was that the, I could, really comfortably rate the camera at 3200 ASA, which is quite fast, um, which meant that all of our deep focus work where the iris is, is quite closed down um, uh, was, was a little bit easier, uh, certainly on the budget, but, um, but just in, in practical terms as well. So that, uh, that was kind of an added bonus. Um, Great. And you know, how, did, how did you approach your work with what you're shooting, um, knowing that there was going to be some rear projection use, some you know paintings, how does that change what you're doing as a cinematographer? Well, you know, David, uh, David is incredibly prepared, and he communicates extremely well. Um, so, you know, we 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 knew pretty much what we were going to do each day, and and we knew um, what directions we were going to look, and and. Uh, you know, we had prepped all that stuff, particularly the matte paintings um, and the set extension work. Um, uh, you know, Don Don had reference material for the you know the Hearst Castle, uh, you know the, the San Simeon ceilings. Um, you know, so we could take that into account when we were lighting it. You know, there were, we we knew where the elephants were going to be in the in the uh, Mank Marion Walk and Talk, and you know we framed for it so. We, we prepped I mean we really you know I think the, the one of the things I'm proud of of the film is that it is ostensibly the movie I think we all set out to make for the most part you know it's 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 not like we we went fishing and we caught it and and you know we we this is, has been uh something we all um certainly all of us uh poured a tremendous amount of effort into and uh, you know, with, with deliberate decisions, you know, de deliberate intentions, I guess I should say. So, um, you know, it's no different than any other movie in that way with David, I, I think. Mm. Oh, but it's pretty special, even by David's <laughs> standards. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I think we've got to wrap up quite soon on time, but I wanted to ask each of you, and this might be like choosing your favorite child, um, you know, from where you're sitting and from what you worked on on the film, is there a moment, is there a scene, is there a costume, is there a particular tapestry you're most proud of? Is there a little detail that you are really proud of with your work? Um, Gigi, could I ask you? Right. Um, no, I, I can't pull one out because with each character, there was something. I will tell you, though, the scene when she's in on the pyre, we shot that at the very beginning. And we walked out in this huge meadow and we had horses and the, the, the light was great and the clouds were terrific and the smoke was coming up. And, and all of a sudden she started talking in that accent and I broke down. I, I was so excited. I got goosebumps. It was like, oh my God, it all came together. It was so exciting. We reshot the scene, but 
at that moment, it was like magic. And we, I'm going to cry. It was like magic. We all felt it. And it was just like, wow. Wow. We can do better, but wow. Yeah. Amazing. Jan, what about for you? Is there something that you recall that is special? Well, there were, there were, one of the things that I loved was that part of, <clears throat> pardon me, aside from the dining room scene, which, you know, once we knew that we had the elements, I felt better. But um, what I loved was that we used a lot of the techniques of the era. Many of the sets were two and three wall sets. Mm. And so what I loved what Dawn had put together. You know, we only built what we needed. And I loved the economy of that and the trickery of that and the old school. It, it's what they would have done in the 30s. And, and I loved that we were employing some of the same techniques. You know, when you look down the long hallway in the, in the, um, uh, well, Eric, help me, the, in the, the. <laughs> In San Simeon, yeah. No, no, in the other place too. The uh, it, it, where he's in bed half the time in the in the. Oh, oh yeah, in um. Yeah, sorry. yeah, uh, uh, in the bungalow, yeah. In the bungalow. Thank you. Sorry. When you look down the long hallway, there were an essence of rooms going off the hallway, but we really only built the little bits that we needed to see, so that Eric could get the depth that he needed. And it, it was just, I loved employing the techniques of that era and, and making it work, you know, that was exciting. And Eric, do you have a favorite shot or something you're especially proud looking back? <clears throat> yeah, I, well, I think that the, the speaking of old techniques that Jan was talking about, the, the, the walk and talk with Mank and Marion through San Simeon that we did day for night is one of my favorites and something we really worked on hard um, to prep and and you know David and I um, went back to the location several times and you know and then when we scouted with Don and Jan and we talked about where we put the lamp posts and how you know that was something that we um, we we really prepared for and and um, and you know we studied the light and I, you know, I didn't sleep the night before we shot that scene because I was so nervous it would be it would be cloudy. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we actually shot it over the several days. So, but it, but it was, um, yeah, that one is something that I, I'm certainly proud of and, and uh, I'm glad we did it that way. You know, it's, uh, I, I think it was pretty special. Indeed, pretty special, that one. <laughs> uh, Trish, do you have a favorite look uh, from the film or a moment? Um. I, it's a, it's hard because it's, it, I mean, we all know it's hard to choose a favorite. I, there's two scenes in particular that I really do like. I really like um, the circus party scene and I do, I do love in the, the costuming there uh, and inside that set, but I really love this whole idea of, you know, Gary's the one who's out of place. When you look at this madcap table of all these, you know, of all these costumes and these hats and everything. And, and he's the one who's out of place in the suit. And I love that he's constantly circling the table like a shark, you know, and everyone's a little on guard waiting to see, are they gonna be next? So more than just the costuming there, I just particularly love the whole layout and, and the idea of, and the essence of that whole scene, I really love. And Don, to come back to you to end, you know, is there yeah. a, 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 a moment in the film you're particularly proud of, a particular piece of the set? Um, is there something that sticks out? Mm. I'm sorry I dropped off there for a moment. I'm having connection issues, but um, you know, it's hard to say. I think, I think one thing is the, the way that we put together the, um, the studios and the way that we, we showed those, you know, by doing it in different locations and so forth. Um, that, that was kind of fun to do and, and, and felt satisfying the way we pulled it off. Um, but like, you know, how long is a piece of string? You know what I mean? It's <laughs> like, which one do you like? Yeah, no, I think that's 
the perfect way to end this chat, really, because there is so much to keep going back to this film. I think it's going to be, you know, if there's if film schools exist in 200 years, I think we're going to be looking at this film. Um, so thank you all so much for your time this evening, especially I know all of you are on to other things. That's how this business works. You're you're busy shooting other projects. So it's really appreciated that you could tell us a little bit about the magic behind the scenes of Mank. Uh, best of luck at the BAFTAs and the Oscars. And thanks again for making this amazing movie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.